the job. He said that John is going to be a Jew. Yeah. And uh, he took with him Umar to go and speak to the boy. His name was Ibn Sayyad. He lived in Medina. And when he went to meet Ibn Sayyad, he questioned him. He suspected that he was Dajjal. The boy was rather impertinent in his replies. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course if he was alive today he'd be called a terrorist. He said, O Messenger of Allah, give me permission, I'll cut off his head. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi responded and said, No, Umar, don't do that. Now listen to the words which follow. If he is Dajjal, this hypothetical statement, if he is Dajjal, could not be made if Dajjal is still in chains. If Dajjal is still in chains, the Prophet would know that. And therefore, this hypothetical, hypothetical statement, if he is the judge, would be not would be impossible to make. If he is the judge, you cannot kill him. And if he is not the judge, it will be sinful to kill him. There is a subtle, subtle message from the Prophet والسلام, in this event indicating to us in a manner that we would understand, not them, that the release of Dajjal has taken place. When the release of Dajjal takes place, that's bad news for those who rejected Muhammad because he's not a Jew. Now punishment will begin. That Ummah loses its validity, tilka ummatun qad khalat. A new ummah is born. Huwajtabakum. And now punishment begins. And this punishment will continue until the last day. And it's going to be the worst possible punishment. And we have to learn, develop the capacity to be able to read and understand the historical process after Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. This is what Allah says, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوَ الْعَذَابِ And your Lord has now announced that he's now going to release against them those who rejected Muhammad Banu Israel. He's going to release against them those who are going to inflict upon them the worst possible punishment. And it will continue until the last day. And so we now have to read history to recognize the signs of Allah unfolding in the historical process. How can a Mufassir writing a tafsir of the Quran fathom what the Quran has to say concerning signs of Allah which have not as yet unfolded in the world. How can you possibly say that the books of Tafsir have exhausted the knowledge that the Quran has come to transmit to mankind? It is not possible. Hmm? As the signs of Allah unfold, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوءًا عَذَابٍ 
as the signs of Allah unfold with greater and greater punishment, escalating punishment upon Banu Israel, upon those who have rejected Muhammad we have to have eyes with which to see and recognize those signs and then correlate them with the verses of the Quran relating to them. So now we turn away from Dajjal to the other side. In Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran, we were introduced to Gog and Magog. This book An Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, it's an attempt on my part to explain the subject. It's not the final word. I may have to write a second edition of this book. And a critical assessment of this book to point out the parts of the book which are valid and other parts which you may want to question is something that I would benefit from. But a Muslim will not turn to this book and just try to find faults in it. Look, where can I find a little crack so I can tear it apart? You do not disrespect truth in such a way. You do not treat your brother in such a way. Not even a non-Muslim. You would read what he has to say. And you recognize those portions which are acceptable as truth and those portions which are questionable. And if you have to respond, even critically, you do so with respect for knowledge, not destructive. In Surah Al Kaf of the Quran, the subject of Gog and Magog was introduced. The pagan Arabs did not know how to recognize the validity of the claim that Muhammad is indeed a prophet. So they finally decided to seek some help from the rabbis in Medina, who said, ask him three questions, one of which, one of which was about a traveler who traveled to the two ends of the earth. When the questions were asked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the answers. And those answers reached the rabbis in Medina. And we have been waiting for more than 1400 years now. Rabbi, didn't you hear the answer? Rabbi, what is your response? Is the answer to the question correct, yes or no? I'm still waiting for an answer. Who is this great traveler? And the question there about someone who possesses two karn. Karn can mean horn. But has Allah used the word karn in the Quran to mean horn? No, he's never done that. Not at all. Well, then does Qarn have any other meaning? Yes, it does. It means an age, an epoch, a time. And that is how it is used in the Quran. So a man who impacts upon two ages, Zul Qarnayn, and he has faith, faith in Allah. But he's endowed by Allah with power, power to pursue any objective he chooses to pursue. And now he travels to the two ends of the earth. And the Quran gives us a taste of what the world could have been like when power